and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Rivet Karnak. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we discuss the coronavirus outbreak and the implications and lessons for climate change. Plus, we talk to Christiana in Australia about the political situation she's encountering there. And we bring you an audience question and answer session from our recent book tour. Thanks for being here. Right, so this week we're all in different places. I'm back home in Somerset in the west of England. Paul is in London and Christian is in Australia. Um, I've been grounded as a result of the coronavirus, like so many of our listeners, I'm sure, as a result of the fact that my kid's school had a policy that if you went to one of these target areas where there is a lot of coronavirus, you have to then exclude yourself and your kids. So Christiana's gone on her own. Um, So she's not joining us at this point, but we are going to give her a call in about 10 minutes or so to figure out what she's finding there. Because, of course, she has stepped into a political maelstrom Uh, off the back of the fires in Australia and now the uh, subsequent refusal of the government to acknowledge the seriousness of the situation. So we're going to dig into the coronavirus outbreak first. But Paul, first of all, how are you? How's everything going at CDP? Yeah, no, I'm fine. And uh, thank you for asking. Um, The organisation that I I primarily represent, the CDP, um, is doing uh, very well in many regards. But I think it's impossible um, to not address um, something unprecedented in my 55 years living on Earth. I mean, this morning, uh, we're recording actually on the, on the 12th of March. This morning, I discovered that the two largest economic areas in the world, the European Union and the United States, have suspended air travel uh, yeah. for 30 days. And, you know, th- this is not like World War Two or something. It's not uh it's not a it's not a situation of that severity. Um but it's certainly my own it's my first living experience of uh, an interruption of that scale, uh, which in terms of the impact on people's lives, the disruption caused um is far larger than, for example, September the eleventh. And I think it just feels like we're in somewhat uncharted territory here. Um and so couldn't acknowledge anything but that at the start of the show. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, and, and I think we have to... It's the first time that, that, that flights have been shut down since they've been technically possible, right? So, um, you know, this is really the first time ever that, as you say, those two large economic powers um, have no... will have no direct, you know, air connection between them, no possibility to travel. And our hearts go out to presumably... Uh, must be tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of people who... Will be stranded, yeah. um, in in a, in a, in a, in, in an, you know the continent that they're not supposed to be in, and uh, you know that will be very uh, troublesome for many people. And once again, hearts go out to them. Of course, you know within the scale of global problems, hunger, water stress, famine, you know these look, uh, you know in 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 the common uh, uh, it, we have a phrase uh, some people use, which is which is a which is a, a kind of cheap joke phrase, you know, their first world problems. Um, but this is actually a, a really serious first world problem. Yeah. So, no, I completely agree with that, Paul. So, so obviously, as Paul said, you know, I mean, the reality is, looking at it, most governments do seem to be very ill-prepared for this. Um, but even in a poor field, the Trump administration seems uniquely inept to deal with it. I mean, Trump first downplayed the issue and now subsequently banning travel to Europe. And that move, actually, most experts seem to think could be counterproductive in some scenarios. But I'm sure our listeners will be getting their news on coronavirus and its spread from lots of sources. And indeed, many of you can probably barely avoid it. So in this episode, we wanted to look at this issue specifically as it relates to climate change and draw that out a bit, both in terms of the implications for climate and also the lessons and there's a lot to, to talk about. So I think we should talk about what it teaches us about responding to a crisis. But first, let's just touch on the emissions picture, because this is kind of bubbling up in the news all over the place at the moment. Um, for the first time in our lives, emissions are now in decline, steep decline. China has 25% lower emissions than this time last year. And the satellite imagery of air pollution, uh, if you haven't seen it, go online and have a look. It's just astonishing, the change in air pollution as a result of this. Flight capacity, as you said, is down now something like 40 to 50%. And so some people are arguing that this might be good news for climate, 
But the problem, of course, is that the reasons that these numbers are down is because of a massive drop in economic activity. And that means that people are not getting their needs met, they're not generating revenue, and if they're not already, then they will start to suffer. So this is not the transition we've been talking about. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, possibly said it best when he said that we are not going to solve climate change with a virus. And he said that, by the way, launching the World Meteorological Association report, a new report that came out on the state of climate that reads like a walk through the Book of Revelations in terms of temperatures on land and the ocean and unprecedented floods and droughts. So we can talk about some of those human impacts. But how are you sort of seeing this sudden drop in emissions, Paul, um, in the sense that some of the some of the sort of manifestation of this are things that people who have been calling for climate action have kind of been calling for, you know, drops in air pollution, drops in air travel, etc. But for this deeply unfortunate and tragic reason, um, how are we going to come out of this kind of interesting period of turbulence? Are we going to learn anything? What do you think? I mean, I think there's a, there's a huge, a huge learning opportunity here. And um, once again, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what could be described as the economic benefits of the, the human response. And, uh, you know, I clearly have to state again that, like everyone, my, my hearts are with um, those, those suffering uh, from the virus, um, those dying from the virus uh, and, and the impact on, on the families, it, it, it's, 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 it's tragic. But I'm going, to, I'm going to speak a little bit about the need for people to communicate without physical travel. And the reason I'm going to focus on that is because our listeners may not know that I've had a, in fact, they won't know, <laughs> I've had something like a 23-year, 24-year near obsession with video communications and have extensively studied this area. And I, I I'm personally am deeply familiar with your obsession with video. <laughs> you, would, you, would be, you would be. It's very hard to avoid it if you know me. And I think probably to try and summarize 24 years of obsessional study of video communication with um, the conversation that we're having at the moment, Perhaps the most interesting thing to say is that uh, it was actually a, 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 a colleague of mine, uh, James Cameron, who said that it can take six to eight weeks for people to free themselves from a habit. Um, hmm. I mean, I remember when I gave up smoking cigarettes 26 years ago, it, it was it was this very difficult six to eight week period. And if you can get over it, you, you, you kind of get out of the habit. It may be that people um, can get out of the habit of so much business travel Um I mean, you know, clearly personal travel, friends and family is, is not something that, that necessarily can be done particularly well electronically, although that might come in the future. But the, the necessity for us to communicate for business reasons, um, we've, we're going to be finding out at the moment how we can do that. And um, certainly at the start of my, my journey 24 years ago, there was a lot of talk of something called video conferencing. And this was really the sense that you could have a number of people on a TV screen and have a meaningful communication with them. But if you think about TV news, they never do that, really. On TV news, you always have just one person uh, talking to you, you know, who's kind of filling the screen. And so I think some of the, the new software uh, from companies like Zoom and Blue Jeans and WebEx, that's allowing people to really communicate one to one or, or even in groups of 10 people or 100 people. But with that camera focus on one person, people may be taking the time uh, to do test calls before they talk, taking the time to set up cameras uh, and, and really saying, well, look, if we're going to communicate like this, let's do it properly. I would say that that learning experience may fundamentally reset the amount of business travel we do, indeed, the amount of commuting we do. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And it's, I mean, listeners won't know we're on Zoom right now, right? I mean, this podcast, people yeah. may think that we're always in the same room, but in fact, we're rarely in the same room. And we do this over Zoom and we record our voices locally. So it sounds to you, the listener, like we're in the same place. But that kind of is an indication or an expression of the fact of what's now possible. And, you know, thank God we do, because we're not going to be able to see each other for some weeks, it looks like now, with coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. but just, just to add... Um, you were speaking with some passion then, uh, Tom, and I turned my, my eyes out, away from the window that I was looking out of at the screen and I saw you look me in the eyes and emphatically use your hand and move. You know, I have a kind of a perfect picture of you here. I feel like I'm in the room with you. Um, that's really, that's, that's something. something that that's something that we've overlooked. And, and, and I'll just say one more thing. You know, we can buy a train ticket in a couple of seconds. We can buy an air ticket in a couple of seconds. 
uh, you can get in your car in a couple of seconds. Whereas actually, you know, doing video properly takes a bit of practice, getting a, a bit of getting used to, taking the time to to really sort out all those details, as I mentioned earlier. But I think, you know, we may well see uh, a, a reset. Um, you know, it could be two, five, ten, twenty, even thirty percent of of business travel and commuting. We could see some real changes. Yeah, that's significant, but it will it's a small part of global emissions, you know, travel overall, although significant and growing. And, you know, the deeper question is whether there is a more fundamental relocalization of our economies as a result of some of this. And I think that global corporations are realizing the fragility of one country's supply chains that everything comes from now that we see this type of change. So I suppose the depth of the lesson learned will in part be correlated with how long it goes on for and how much pain it creates, right? Yes. Um, And uh, I was actually discussing with a colleague yesterday that perhaps one of the most valuable things for us, I mean, because, you know, I'm I'm not ashamed to say, uh, and I know know you're not, Tom, and, uh, and perhaps Christiane would be happy to say the same thing as well. We're we're not afraid to talk about a really different society. Mm. I don't mean the laws change. I don't mean that, you know, I'm not talking about kind of political with a large P. Um, that's not the kind of change I'm talking about. Um, but what I think we all talk about is is decarbonizing our energy system, decarbonizing our food system, decarbonizing our transport system, decarbonizing our industry. There are huge changes going to be necessary, as as we've discussed extensively, very much over the next 10 years. And I think that this um, tragic um, uh, pandemic, as as the WHO now calls it, um, allows us to sort of envisage um, business not as usual. Mm. And, And out of the sort of tragedy and the discomfort, I hope we may also be able to see um, uh, 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 have the freedom to 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 imagine the world in a, in a different way, and that and that freedom uh, to imagine the world in a different way may be may be the, the the valuable thing that comes out of this this awful thing. And that's, I mean, I think that there is the hopeful side. The the, the dangerous side, of course, is that it distracts us at a moment of absolutely consequential. Um, importance that we need to remain focused on this to actually step up ambition the Glasgow summit you know everything that's going to happen this year I mean one statistic from this world meteorological organization report that came out is that of following years of steady decline hunger is now on the rise again driven by specifically driven by a changing climate and extreme weather events and that 820 million people were affected last year by hunger and that this year that's likely to be higher particularly because of the droughts and then the heavy rains in Africa, which led to the worst locust outbreak in decades. So, you know, the numbers that are affecting people from climate change are higher even than the very interesting and frightening predictions that are coming out about coronavirus. But just just a word, an interesting sort of thing that I've been observing in terms of how people are reacting to this online is the kind of how do we respond to these different types of crises. And one thing that struck me is you remember um, a long time ago, uh, we we uh, like nine months ago or something, we sat down with Greta and we talked with her. And I think afterwards in some of the reflections, I kind of said, um, you know, it's a bit disquieting to just see how deeply this is affecting her and how much she lives with this anxiety and this fear of what's going to happen every day and kind of being up close to that for some days, you know, really sort of drove home to me what it's like to live through this, even though I kind of feel like I live with it. For her, it's another level. And it strikes me that that level of anxiety and and concern and fear is now being felt by an enormous number of people. And it sort of strikes me a little bit that the boomer generation is now feeling the fear about coronavirus that Generation Z is feeling about climate change. I wonder if there'll be any kind of coming together around any of that. No, I think actually you, you've made a very beautiful um, observation there, uh, Tom. And, you know, you dig down in, in into climate change um, and many other uh, 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 problems we face, not least the coronavirus or famine, as you mentioned. And the important uh, response of humanity comes from the the deep well of empathy that can and should live within us. And that empathy can be expressed 
through our personal actions, whether they're whether they're, you know that the the charitable, the good deeds, or or you know however we 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 conduct ourselves as sort of individual citizens, it can be expressed. That empathy can be expressed through our work. If we work in in government, or if we work in business, or in investment institutions, we can have more empathy, and we can exercise that in our work. And then critically through our systems of government, we can again, you know, use the the big we, not the little me, but the big me, <laughs> uh, our states to um, express empathy, uh, you know, the, the rich countries supporting the poor countries and all countries looking after the vulnerable. I, I, I think that we can hope that that collective comprehension of vulnerability can, can draw out that empathy, which is perhaps the, you know, a, a somewhat neglected um, capability in, in, in a very uh, commercial late 20th and certainly 21st yeah. century. Because that's been a deadening influence on the human spirit in a way, what you just described there. And I think, you know, humanity needs to flex its muscle of doing big things together. And this is a big thing, responding to coronavirus. If we can kind of come together as humanity and get on top of this. I mean, I've seen some amazing stuff online about if we dealt with the climate crisis at the speed and scale of the urgency that we're dealing with coronavirus, you know, we would stop all subsidies to fossil fuels tomorrow. Um, you know, we'd be in renewables kind of right away. We would relocalize supply chains. We'd do it all in the next five years. And it might require some upfront investment, but God, we know it's worth it. So, you know, that has to be the the location at which we place our sense of possibility in this, is that humanity is learning how to do big things again. And it's doing it on the back foot and we're kind of being taught how to do it. But if we can come together and do this, actually, the next thing we do can be even bigger. Uh, that's very, very well put, Tom. And just on the kind of, I'm going to call it even the engineering side, you know, I'm I'm very struck. You know, you, you can look back in the history books or something and like sometimes like a big ship would be launched, I don't know, 100 years ago, like a big metal ship um, and you know, in whatever country. And and like thousands of people would gather around for this big ship and it was unprecedented and new and it would be in all the newspapers, you know, big ship launched, right? In 2020, we have ships that are so big. They are, you know, 20 times, 40 times the size of these ships of 100 years ago. We launched them 20 times a day, you know, yeah. and we never, then they never get in the newspapers, right? So we, we have to recognize that we're sitting on top of the most extraordinary logistical and engineering capability, but we've kind of forgotten how much agency we've got. We've forgotten how influential we can be. We feel like we're, we're little, you know, ants in this great storm, but actually uh, we're the tigers that are making the storm and we're the tigers that can stop it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, so we are going to bother Christiana now. Uh, let's see, 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 see if we can reach her. She's in Australia. I think it's what pretty... What time is it for her? I think it's about 11 o'clock at night and she's had these... I mean, I've got to say, at the end of the last two weeks of like DC, New York, London, I was finished, right? I mean, we had like Aww. 10 events a day. Christiana, at the end of which I came home and slept for two days, Christiana got on a plane and went to Australia and carried on. She hasn't stopped yet. Um, I know. Uh, I asked her if she was going to sleep on the plane. She says, "Well, I have to prepare for speeches in five cities." I honestly, I'm kind well, of nearly melted now. The sort of seven hundred emails I got from her after she landed indicated that she didn't work, <laughs> didn't sleep too much. <laughs> so uh, we've never done this before. Uh, how's the tech going to work, Tom? So because Christiana is moving around, I think she's in a car. I'm just going to give her a call. So I'm going to try and call her from Skype. Okay, so dear listeners, um, we are going to um, we're going to decline from our usual uh, pixel perfect quality of audio. If you'll forgive me using a visual analogy, but we'll see how we get on. Tom is pressing buttons, and let's try her. Okay, seven. So shall I shall I read her number out on the on the no, Don't don't <laughs> security. <laughs> All right, I'm going to press go. Now, just before, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. I was on Twitter this week and getting frustrated at the way that everybody was kind of winding each other up about coronavirus. And I made a, an offer, which I would now extend to our podcast listeners as well. I have a pretty limited selection or a pretty limited number of copies of The Future We Choose, which have been sent to me by the publisher. But I think that we can do better than spending our coronavirus isolation sitting at home yelling at each other on Twitter. I think we should spend it reading. And did you know that during the Black Death isolation period, 
Newton was working from home, which is where he discovered the laws of gravity. So a huge amount can be discovered when you're working from home. And one place you might begin is with the book we just wrote called The Future We Choose. So if you write to us, podcast at globaloptimism.com, and tell us that you are self-isolating because of coronavirus, if we have any of these limited number of copies left, we'll just send you one. Send us your address and you get a free copy. Thank you, Tom. That's an excellent offer. I would encourage you to take it up. It's a brilliant book. Right. Let's see if we can reach Christiana. The number you entered is invalid. Please try again. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to talk to the listeners about video. <laughs> sorry, sorry, listeners. No, yeah, you know, you see, it's, until Tom connects to Christiana, you're stuck with me talking about a 24-year obsession. So it is, it is, you know, one of the things... That- hey, everyone. It's Clay, producer, back in the studio putting together the episode. I want to explain what happened next. So while Tom attempted to dial Christiana on the phone... Paul had a brilliant monologue on the theory of telecommunications that, unfortunately, we just don't have time for in this episode, but I'll let him sum up his masterclass in one sentence. And like all virtual communications, it may not go smoothly. Uh, This proved to be very true for us trying to make a phone call, and at one point we got a hold of Marina, executive producer, who was in contact with Christiana and helped us create a digital conference room where Christiana could meet us while we were all halfway around the world from each other. <laughs> no, from you're, you're currently making a cameo appearance on Outrage and Optimism. Welcome, Marina. How is poor Christiana doing? She must be going crazy trying to get in here. So she said suave, which means like, say, which means like, hang on, like, hold on, keep calm and relax. That's a great word. <laughs> Uh, right. Okay. Well, Paul and I. Okay. So, what am I trying to get at here? Okay. I wanted to play all of this for you because, as we're all video conferencing and telecommuting for the foreseeable future, learning new apps, trying to make calls to Australia, you know, when it gets difficult, just remember we're all in this together. And sometimes it takes a little bit of this to get to this. It's an empathetic ringtone. She, I think, she, Christiana. Hi, guys. Hey, how are you? Oh, hey. Greetings from Sydney. This has been a hectic, hectic uh, Adelaide, Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, all within what seems like six hours, but I'm sure it's a little bit more. In any event, um, so I thought it might be interesting to just touch uh, a little bit on... um, on the impact that the bushfires have had here. But um, a couple of things that I wanted to share with you that I have learned. First, um, from talking to scientists, how concerned they are, not only about the death of the animals during the bushfires that today I learned is 1 billion vertebrates, because if we count invertebrates, it would go into trillions. Um, But they're also very concerned about now post bushfires about the starvation that the surviving animals are under because they don't have any food because all of their food, i.e. everything that was growing there has actually been burned uh, to, uh, to tithers. And so there are just millions of animals that are now very possibly going to starve to death in addition to the ones that burned. They're also very concerned about how the vegetation is going to come back because once all of this has burned, obviously we lose the biodiversity that has been there for many, many years. Um, And the first thing that is going to come in is weeds. And those weeds will not allow for other plants to grow and they're very concerned that the weeds will cover completely the um, the soil and not even allow for other seeds that might come in through the wind or through animal dispersion to uh, to recover the 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 bush that was there they also pointed out that this is the first time that we see a continent on fire we mm. tend to think of Australia as a country but actually it's a continent. It's huge. A whopping 2% of the continent, basically around all edges, was on fire for months. And on top of that, sorry to give you all this bad news, but on top of that, um, it has been determined that bushfires are now already because 
Antarctic, um, because Australia is warming more than the average planet temperatures, these kinds of bushfires are already today 30% more likely than they used to be even just five or 10 years ago. But if we get to an average two degrees for the planet, which would be 2.5 or maybe a little bit more for Australia, the likelihood of this type of disastrous um, bushfire actually increases by 400 or 800 percent. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is just absolutely unfathomable. And the the vulnerability of uh, of Australia to climate change has really come into very, very stark reality in front of everybody. Now, the good news around all of this is that because this has been such a disaster, public opinion is really shifting. And in fact, I had a couple of people tell me that they think that this has started to undermine the Murdoch controlled press. And um, that, you know, there can be no more obfuscation of the facts and of the truth and that public opinion is shifting. I don't know if you've already reported all of the corporations that have actually come out to say we have understood and we're going to zero net by 2050. Mm. And those include Qantas the huge Australian airline, um, Telstra, the telecommunication company, and very surprisingly, BHP and Rio Tinto, two huge mining companies that have actually understood they cannot continue um, mining um, and, uh, and certainly not mining coal. So that is actually you know, quite a shift in private sector support for climate policy. We also have now the Business Council of Australia, plus called the Australia Industrial Group, that has also undertaken zero net by 2050, plus every single state and territory has now taken a, um, a target of zero net by 250. So this is a huge shift from where Australia was last year. The, the one uh, standing resistance, piece de, re, de resistance, um, <laughs> continues to be um, the federal government. However, um, they are very much losing ground and losing credibility, and they are beginning to look for where is the common ground going to be. It's not going to be easy because it has been just as a divisive issue as in the United States, if not more so, as we know, these climate wars have been going ongoing between the political parties for 12, uh, for 12 years. But um, very interesting that the prime minister is already beginning to give a little bit of a different message to where he was um, last year. And just to tie in to the main topic of today's um, podcast, what has been fascinating is that the federal government has been so accused of mismanaging the bushfires that they have now moved into absolute 100% attention on coronavirus because um, they don't want to be accused of mismanagement of two fires, uh, one right after the other. And they are just into high gear here uh, in terms of managing uh, the risk from coronavirus. So a couple of things that I can um, add to the discussion on coronavirus. One, one is the big lesson that global issues uh, see no boundaries and they see no passports. Mm. And, um, and you know, that to pretend that nations can isolate themselves in any way from these global issues is just, uh, has, has been again proven to, uh, to be wrong. The other uh, lesson for me is how quickly human behavior can change when the perception of threat is imminent. Yeah. So to everyone who says, well, it takes a lot of time to change human behavior. Well, this has been a dramatic uh, proof of the fact that humans can, we all can change our behavior very quickly, like overnight, um, if, uh, if the threat seems imminent enough versus 
climate change that doesn't seem imminent. But as I said before, because the bushfires have made that very imminent in Australia, that actually can lead um, to climate um, to much better climate policy. But but fundamentally, the other thing that I have been musing on is the fact that although we're now probably at the height of the um, virus crisis and, uh, and everyone is increasingly in lockdown, eventually, let's say over several months, and nobody knows how, how many that's going to be, but we will return to, uh, to health and we will return to normal travel and, and normal procedures on even buying toilet paper because the crisis here in Australia is about toilet paper. There's no more toilet paper to be had. Um, and, you know, huge fights breaking out here between people who want more toilet paper. But different to that, the, our health system and our personal health will return to normal after this crisis. That is not so about climate change. Yeah. We will never return to normal whatever normal used to be. And we are only on a path of incremental um, deepening of the, of the crisis. So we should not, you know, yes, there are some lessons to be learned, but they're fundamentally different threats, yeah. fundamentally different. Um, and that are on a, um, on, on a curve that is quite different. So, so Christiana, thank you so much for that summary Thank you on behalf of our Australian listeners. My dear deceased father was born in Australia, so I'm going to try and speak for them. Thank you for going and giving so much help, for winning the Sydney Peace Foundation gold medal, for getting a standard ovation at WOMAD Adelaide. Um, thank you for bringing clarity to uh, a place that's been very confused recently. Yeah. And I would also add that I can hear in your voice. I mean, I said in the podcast before you arrived, Christiana, that you and I, I was finished by Friday when I came home and slept for a weekend and you got straight on a plane and went to Australia and I haven't seen you for a few days. I can hear in your voice now that you have been probably giving public speeches and interviews nonstop since I last saw you. And I think we should let you go and get some sleep. <laughs> you know, that actually is a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for dialing in. I know our listeners will really appreciate it and sharing that perspective. All right, guys. See you soon. Thank you, Christiana. Stay Bye. healthy. Soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Perfect. And now just at the end of the book tour, uh, what we're going to bring you today, instead of an interview uh, with somebody, we had a super interesting discussion with Tom Friedman at the Politics and Prose um, book launch event in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago. And in fact, we played you the majority of that evening um, in a previous podcast, the discussion with Tom. Uh, but actually, there was a really nice interaction with the audience after that. It was like maybe, you know, a few hundred people sitting in a bookshop amongst the shelves. And then there was a microphone and Tom would call them up to come and ask questions. And we had this great discussion. So we thought as a way of kind of delving into the issues of the book, which have formed such a fundamental part of the podcast, um, we would we would play you that discussion with with these brilliant and insightful members of the public who are asking these great questions. So, hope you enjoy it. Here you go. Let's hear it. The floor is open. There's a microphone up here um, for anyone who'd like to ask a question. Come on up, and uh, uh, after that, in a few minutes, uh, Tom and Christiana will sign books. Uh, right up here, please come to the microphone and tell us your name and um, shoot a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Jessica Langerman. I'm with an organization called Climate Exchange, and we're working very hard on carbon pricing legislation, which is a terribly difficult political slog. And I'm curious if you can tell me where carbon pricing for you fits into your vision of the future, if, if it does. Uh, well, it would definitely be the one single measure that would accelerate this more than anything else, agreed. Um, and as I'm sure you know, there are two different ways of pricing carbon. One is putting a tax and the other one is doing an, uh, uh, a trading scheme. Um, there are already 60 jurisdictions around the world that have a carbon price. The problem is, A, it's not a universal price. B, it's way too low. Um, and they are not linked. and It's not fungible across those jurisdictions. So um, we have been struggling, and it's the one really, really important thing that was meant to be adopted in the package of the Paris Agreement that was not. 
um, and was left dangling. And still today, five years later, it is still dangling. And the result of that is that most jurisdictions have now moved forward to actually decide on how they're going to put a price on carbon, but only for their just jurisdiction. And that is the situation that we will probably have for maybe, I don't know, two or three more years until we can get over this hump. Um, and there are, several, there are several proposals here in the United States. The one that I'm thinking of right now, I believe, is called the Partisan Climate Roadmap that actually proposes with the support of both leading Republicans and leading Democrats, proposes something that hopefully would have bipartisan support to put a price on carbon and to redistribute that venue to the revenue to those who need it the most. That is the really important part, because otherwise we end up in a situation like we have in Paris with the, or in France with the yellow vest. So to do something like that that is necessary, that accelerates the transformation that we have to have, but that is fair from a social point of view and an economic point of view, is absolutely critical, as well as having something, a proposal, where you can finally bring both sides of the aisle together. It is nonsense. It is ridiculous. It is unacceptable. And many other adjectives that I could use, that this situation on addressing climate change is still a politicized issue in the United States. It is ridiculous. And we have to get over it. We have to have proposals that make sense to both sides. That could be one. Thank you. Hi, Christiana and Tom. Uh, my name is Marty Grady. I'm a junior at Vanderbilt University and a very big fan of Outrage and Optimism, your podcast. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> and back in July, you guys did a live Q&A uh, that gave me a question I want to ask you today. So last fall, I, I cold emailed a bunch of organizations to get two passes to go to COP25 in Madrid. And so I was in the blue zone for both weeks. And uh, similar to the themes of outrage and optimism, I left optimistic about civil society, but a little bit outraged about the state of the negotiations themselves. And Christiana, you said in your, your live Q&A back in July um, that part of the Is COP this going to come back to haunt me now? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it, it just informs a, a so question. Just explain, Outrage and Optimism is our podcast that we put out yeah. every week in which Tom's been on. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you mentioned in that live Q&A uh, that part of the COP presidency has to do with having existing relationships that would help that's one of the things that helped you be successful. Yeah. Um, recently, uh, Claire Perry O'Neill, who had been selected president for the UK's COP26 bid along with Italy, um, she was, well, according to you, someone who had those good relationships. So you were optimistic about her being the president of COP26. And recently, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson let her go and replaced her with someone else. Uh, so I just wanted to hear your reactions to how that might affect the preparedness for of Britain for COP26. Thank you for that good question. Well, let's hear from the British citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that the lesson from 2015 is that you get out what you put into it, right? The French were amazing. The diplomatic outreach, they used every single embassy. The president, Hollande, was fully engaged with this. The foreign minister, Fibius, Laurence Tubiana, the, the special envoy. Every level of that system was fully engaged in this. And the UK needs to mimic that. Right. So the UK diplomatic outreach going through this very complicated year that the UK is going through has to also be engaged in this way because Glasgow is different from Paris in the sense that there's no negotiated outcome or very limited negotiated outcome. It's all about can national governments be called upon to step up with deeper ambition than they had in 2015. And Honestly, the politics is more challenging now than it was then. Then we had John Kerry flying around the world trying to help the French. Now you have a US which is being intransigent and very obstreperous and blocking. Um, you have Australia doing the same. You have Brazil. So the UK has a tough political outreach program. However, there is a huge amount of support behind that. We've already seen 80 countries declare that they will step up further and faster. Unfortunately, it's the smaller countries and we need the big ones. But I think the UK has amazing people that are working in the team. I think the new president seems well positioned um, to, to, to be successful in that role. And the final thing I would say is that um, so much of this is about the momentum in the movement around them, right? So the UK currently has a right of center government that has delivered an incredibly unpopular policy in the form of Brexit. And what we're seeing now is the UK environmental movement slightly sort of 
chucking rocks, saying it's not going to be successful, etc. That has to change, right? The UK environmental movement, this is too important to be in that camp. The UK environmental movement has to get behind this and support the current outreach because this is the best shot we have this year for making progress. And I would just add that the UK government has a double incentive to do a good job. One is for the climate, but the other is the reason why the UK ball put up its hand and said, we will host uh, COP26 is because they knew that they were delivering Brexit and they wanted some very serious international role that would prove that post-Brexit, they are still an international leader. So that's why they put up their hand. Um, and so they have that huge incentive. So they have an incentive for climate and they have an incentive for their international positioning. Thank you Thank for your you. question. Hello, Please. my uh, name is James Lang Henry, and I was born in the Anthropocene. Yay! Yeah. That's the way you have to present yourself from now on. <laughs> uh, now, my question actually dovetails off the previous, um, with COP26 and most COPs being so close to American elections, is um, how negotiators enter in with that big variable of who will become the president or perhaps control the legislature. Is how do you prepare? Uh, entering into such a large negotiation for a variable that will not be made clear until days before uh, the negotiations and how the UK and the international community handles that. Good question. Well, in, in, in this case, it's actually completely predictable um, because no matter what happens in this country, um, the COP will occur under Trump administration. And so uh, uh, the contribution, the leadership, the vision, uh, and the responsibility of the UK team is completely predictable, a big fat zero. So, and, and you know, we all know that, right? So we can plan around that. Um, now, obviously, there will be presence from other stakeholders, um, other political parties. Nancy Pelosi went to COP25. Uh, there will be the presence of large corporations, of governors, uh, of all kinds of representatives of both public subnational as well as private leaders in the United States who will also be there because they're interested in everyone knowing that there is not a one monolithic opinion about this in the United States. And so that we are still in movement, which is actually a pretty powerful movement um, that is now moving 65% of the um, economy in the United States toward decarbonization will also be present there. And um, I, I have been at a COP where you have the US, uh, the official US um, team in one room a small room, by the way, and then you have a huge tent, you know, with a, I don't know how many flags. With music and with drinks. With music and drinks and the big sign that says, the real US. And, you know, so let, let's see what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, all jokes aside, um, this is a very consequential election. This is a very consequential election. This presidential election, it is consequential Definitely for climate, because four years of inaction and of wanting to roll things back could more or less be managed, but eight years will really be very, very difficult to deal with. But it is a consequential election on all other issues. All other issues on, the, well, I, I shouldn't get, I shouldn't get Tom started on this. <laughs> Um, but there is barely an issue that is important to the citizenry of this country for which this election is not really a watershed election. And so going back to the, to the book, one of the things that we say that is fundamental in climate change is voting. Voting can only occur at the individual level. It is the most important signal that we send about what we want our future to be, what we want our country to be, what we want our city to be. And honestly, if we don't, everybody go out to vote, whichever way you want, but it's got to be voting. There's got to be voting and you have to show what the citizens in this country really hold uh, as important. Hi, uh, my name is Carl. Thanks for being here. I wish my nephew was here. He could use some of your optimism mm. and outlook. 
Um, my question is a bit specific and probably odd. So um, what piece of aerospace technology, whether it's earth observation for land use, water, all that kind of good stuff, do you think will help best serve us moving forward in the future to be able to both, you know, deal with what's coming and make it better and get that option two that we all want? Interesting. Good question. Aerospace. Aerospace. Wow. I have a sort of answer that you can go ahead, we'll go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. So it's taken us a long time to figure out where emissions are coming from, what the tracking is, both from emissions themselves and also from land use change. And some of the technology that's now been developed, I don't know if this is your question if I'm going off on a tangent, but from satellite tracking and monitoring, et cetera, has made a huge impact. I mean, what Google did with fishing is an interesting example of that, right? And so deforestation. The, and deforestation. So, I mean, with shipping, they were able to look for the patterns of movement of boats to know what kind of net they were using and then send out other boats to intercept if they were fishing in restricted areas. With deforestation, we'll be able to map very closely with, it, with impartial objective data really what's going on in country. So I think those have become indispensable tools. And what we're now seeing is we can track methane leakage, we can track greenhouse gas emissions, we can see whether countries are really being honest about their targets. I think that's really going to be essential. And at, at the risk of this being a hymn for, you know, the wonders of Google, the other thing that Google has done is it has actually uh, used Google Earth to map all roofs. You, your roof, you can go in and you can figure out, it, would it make sense to you to put a solar panel on your roof? Because um, they, I'm sorry to tell you, but they know exactly how big your roof is, what the, you know, angle is and how much uh, insulation you get on your roof. And you can very quickly figure out would it be cost effective for you to have a solar panel there or should you go with a different kind of renewable energy? And when you can have that service for everyone around the world, that makes a big difference, right? Because then you can make personal decisions about whether you want to depend on the public utility delivering you junk energy uh, or whether you want to actually go for it uh, and assume responsibility for your own energy. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more, and then we'll better um, uh, have time to sign books. It's good luck. Or maybe two more. <laughs> um, Real quick. <laughs> hi, so my name's Ivana Valdez, um, and I really want to dig your brains to see your advice for the youth, you know, given that it's such an urgent time and it is our choice these next 10 years, especially before 2030. Um, what is your advice to how, to how to strengthen the workforce around working with climate change issues? And how do you make it more enticing for the youth? You know, someone that just um, became a working professional this year. Um, I'm working with NDC Partnership and we're um, helping implement NDCs. To me, it's the clearest choice. It's the most enticing area to work in. It's something I'm passionate about. But what about um, maybe people that are very into science, um, but maybe are like, no, no policy, not for me. Um, maybe people that are very into policy and don't really understand ecosystems. So how can you kind of strengthen this integrated workforce so we can collectively get there? Good question. And yeah, your advice. So I, I think, first of all, a round of applause for youth who's in the streets, right? Whoa. So cool, and they, they need, honestly, all the support uh, that we can give them. Um, and I also think that uh, we have been trained to think that we as individuals can't have an effect, and particularly if we're young, uh, we can't have an effect, and that is completely wrong. Um, and let me just give you a couple of areas in which youth are having a remarkable effect. So first, as Tom was saying, you know, taking the leadership and going out on the streets and, you know, a huge call out, especially to young women, because most probably like nine tenths of all of the leaders of young people are young women between the ages of 10 and 18. How cool is that? That is very cool, right? Secondly, uh, would you know that you actually have the CEOs of the oil and gas companies actually trembling from the knees? Did you know that? Because the one thing that they consistently say is the most powerful menace to the future of their industry is their ability, inability 
to attract the best and the brightest minds. Because the best and the brightest minds no longer want to work for irresponsible companies. And particularly, mm. they no longer want to work for industries that belong in the museum, in a very pretty museum. Buy them a museum. Um, and, 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 you know, the best and the brightest want to work for industries and companies that are building the 21st century, not for those who are nailing the coffin on the 20th century. So, you know, it, consistently, and I work with quite a few CEOs and they, of the oil and gas companies, and they always say, oh, my God. We can't attract the young people. And they know that they need those bright minds who have, A, more cells than we do because our cells, are, you know, we don't have to go into that, how many brain cells we have already lost, right? We already know that. Um, so you have many more brain cells than we do. Um, but also, they know that the only way to business continuity is to reinvent their, their companies. <clears throat> they need people who come to ask very difficult questions in their companies, and nobody wants to go work with them. So that's a very important power that young people can, should exercise more. Um, and the third piece that does not um, include everyone, sadly, but uh, most of the wealth in this world is actually being passed on to the new generation over the next five years. And there are uh, a very small number, but very, very wealthy families who are passing on their wealth to young people who are currently between their 30s and 35. And they are turning over the responsibility for the management of that wealth to those young people. Those young people do not want to invest like their parents did. And there is a huge generational conflict right now because the older generation says, well, you know, of course, we've made our money, you know, invested on high carbon. Money. And the young people are saying, bullshit. Okay, we don't want our money there. We want our money, even if it's inherited, right? Even if we haven't solidly worked for it, even if it's inherited, we want to make sure that that wealth is actually kept for future generations. And if we keep it where it is, we're going to lose the value of those assets. So A, we want that where there is long-term value, not short-term. And B, we're also not that no longer so interested in getting huge returns for our uh, for our investments if the huge returns are the price that we're going to pay for destroying the planet. What's the point of having money when we've destroyed the planet? What's the point of that? So they're willing to go for somewhat lower um, uh, interest rates uh, if those investments are actually solid investments with respects to environment, social issues and governance. The fun thing that they have discovered is that actually we're already on the tipping point of that and those investments are actually having better returns. That was unexpected, but it is true. So whether it is from your political pressure, including voting and going to the streets, whether it is from your brain pressure or whether it is from at least some of you who, are, who have that wealth, you have power that you have no idea. You're making the financial institutions quake in, the, in their own shoes. You're making the CEOs of oil companies quake in their shoes, and they should. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So, Paul, we were so sorry that you couldn't join us in D.C., although very nice that you could join the parties in London, although actually you were noticeably absent from the events themselves, but we did see you at the party. <laughs> uh, but tell me, what did you what did you think of that discussion? Um, I mean, it's always just inspiring to see how brilliant everybody is, you know. <laughs> Uh, your questioners like popping up and every one of them is working in an incredibly cool organization doing fantastic things on climate change. And it's like, oh, <laughs> um, I, I actually w wanted to, one thing I picked up on, I mean, there was so much there, but one thing I picked up on was, uh, I think you made the comment um, about the, the COP26 coming up in Glasgow and the role of the UK government, that it was um, most sort of desirable and necessary for uh, green NGOs, uh, you know, the NGOs working on climate change to not 
kind of throw stones at a government that um, they might be ideologically opposed to, you know, in simple terms. It's often the case that a lot of people, you know, worried about the environment are a little bit more of the left. Not all, far from it, but, you know, kind of they're more vocal perhaps. And then, you know, we've got, like I said, say centre-right government or right-wing government here in the UK and recognising um, that, that this is about absolute unity of purpose to make yeah. the, uh, the, the COP26 a success in Glasgow. I thought that was a point you made extremely well. Awesome. All right. This has been fun. Thanks for joining us this week, everyone. Good to talk to you. Bye for now. So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism and is produced by Clay Carnell and executive produced by Marina Mancilla. I'd like to thank Callum Grieve, Pete Kluttenbrock, Sarah Thomas, Chloe Revel, Daniel Fink, Sylvie Snow Thomas, and the team at L Communications, Zoe Sherlock Antich, Lara Richardson, James Douglas, Kaylin Allen, Sharon Johnson, Nigel Topping, and Michael Northrup. A big thank you this week again to Politics and Pros for hosting Future We Choose book event and the Q&A. Thank you to Tom Friedman for the conversation. And thank you to everyone who asked a question. We love getting questions from all of you. If you have one, send it over to podcast at globaloptimism.com. You can find us online at Global Optimism, or you can search the hashtag Future We Choose on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Tom and Christiana's book, The Future We Choose, is available to purchase on ebook, audiobook, and physical copy wherever you get your books. Okay, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye.